I like to uh, play sport, uh, both individual and team sports. And I've been fortunate enough in my life to have many opportunities to do so, both at a social and representative level in a wide range of different sports. Uh, and from this experience, one major thing has stuck out at me. And that is regardless of how gifted an individual is, a team of like-minded people can accomplish more. Regardless of the talent of an individual, a team with a shared goal and mindset on how to achieve it can do more than the individual. I was part of a uh, touch footy team where our star player thought he knew better than the coach. He never acted in solidarity or harmony with the team. He always changed the game plan and he spoke in a demanding way to the rest of the team. Now, in many cases, he was right. But because of the disharmony, because of the harshness of his speech, and despite his individual brilliance, the result was turnover after turnover. See, in order for our team to be effective, not only did the individuals need to be gifted, not only did they need to have specific roles, they needed to know what the role was and they needed to be working together to, towards accomplishing it. Not demanding of one another, not going their own way. The team needs to be aiming at the same thing, encouraging one another, working in unison, fulfilling their individual roles and helping each other. I was also on a hockey team once where the centre half and the centre forward were fighting each other. I don't remember exactly what it was over, but it was probably some girl that they both liked. And the result was that it tore the team apart. People would not pass to each other. There would be arguments and fights during the game, not with the other team, but within our own team. And no one would listen to the coach. See, for the sake of our shared goal, we needed to work together to put aside our differences, but we couldn't. And as a result, in a few short weeks, we went from the top of the ladder, undefeated, to dead last. And the point, the, the point here is that solidarity, harmony, harmony with your team, with your church, and humility, putting others before you is necessary for things to work. Now, with this in mind, let's work our way through our passage this morning, through Philippians 2, 1 to 4. First, by noticing the fourfold incentive which Paul provides here, and then following that up with his points of application. So, you'll notice that he begins with the word, if. This isn't really a question. What Paul is doing here is saying that there is, in fact, reason. There is, in fact, reason. He's creating a condition to provoke the Philippians, to provoke us to ask ourselves the question, do these qualities exist in my life? And then he runs through these essentials of the Christian's life, which provide the underpinnings for the exhortation that begins in verse 2 and continues into 3 and 4. So first of all, he reminds them of the encouragement that exists from being united with the Lord Jesus Christ. He has made it perfectly clear to the Philippians that their relationship is a result of God's grace to them. And that they are living as Christians because of that fact that God has united them to his son. This is a favorite phrase of Paul. He says, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. And this whole notion of being in Christ and then elsewhere of Christ being in us weaves together this wonderful picture of what it means to be a Christian as to become one. 
Just as in a marriage, you have two single individuals, they come together, and as a result of their coming together, their lives are now completely interwoven with one another. Becoming a Christian is a bit like getting married. God accepts us in his Son. We embrace Christ in all of his love. And we are never the same again. And we are united with Christ. So says Paul, if there is encouragement from that, and there certainly is, then you should draw encouragement from it for yourselves. And so to be united with Christ means that we can never be out of his presence. It means that everywhere we go, he is with us. It's not that Jesus is with me at St. Stephen's and then I get in my car and I'm on my own. Or Jesus was with me at a certain point and then I go home to my house and I'm on my own. But if I'm united with Christ, then I am always with him. He is closer to me than actually my hands and my feet. My life is totally interwoven with the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is just like the poem, you may have come across it many years ago, Footprints in the Sand, which I'll just remind you, it depicts a man's dream. In this dream, he's walking along the beach with Jesus and scenes from his life flash across the sky. And as the last scene of his life flashed before him, he looked back at the footprints in the sand. He noticed that At the most difficult times of his life, there were only one set of footprints. Troubled by this, he asked Jesus, why would you leave me in my most desperate times of need? And the Lord replied, my son, I love you and I would never leave you. During your times of trial and suffering, when you see only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. See, Christ doesn't leave us when we become saved, when we become Christians. We are united with him. So Paul says, you have encouragement from your union with Christ. Then he says, any comfort from love, any participation or fellowship, same word, in the spirit, any affection and sympathy. One of the greatest problems of contemporary life is that so many of us are unhappy, lonely, lacking in companionship, feeling ourselves, even when surrounded, to be absolutely alone. We manage to disguise it with superficial conversation and a fake smile, but we still walk away from gatherings of people and feel absolutely desperately lost. The Christian need never be in that predicament because there is encouragement from being united with Christ and there is comfort from his love. And the word that is used there for comfort is a word that isn't just a simple, cozy word, but is a word which has a power and attractiveness to it. It is a word that is a doing word. It is something that creates an element within our lives. And since there is comfort in the love of the Lord Jesus, we are to draw from it and drink deep in relationship to it. And this comfort in his love is something that obligates us as well as blesses us. Thirdly, if there is any fellowship with the Spirit, And we're back again at the word which we've become familiar with, the the word koinonia, or the word partnership. And And the fellowship or partnership that the Christian enjoys is first of all a fellowship with God and with the Spirit of God. That the resources of God, the Holy Spirit, have been made available to us in our lives that when somebody comes to trust in Christ, not only are we justified and declared righteous in his sight, but God comes to indwell 
our lives and to fill us with his spirit. It's not that we simply exchange one set of life processes for another, a new religious process, but it is that we have been born from above. And there is tremendous partnership in the spirit The Holy Spirit comes alongside to enable us, comes alongside to help us understand the Bible, comes alongside to make Jesus precious to us. This was one who came alongside, a helper, to enable something to take place, such as the ministry of God, the Holy Spirit. And it is the Spirit that not only unites us to himself, but unites us to one another. And then fourthly, he says, if there is any tenderness and compassion or if there is any affection and sympathy, another translation. Now, he is simply pointing out that the believer's knowledge of the mercy and compassion of Lord Jesus Christ ought to lead us to express a similar tenderness and compassion to one another. It's possible for us to be hardened by life's bumps and bruises by the mistreatment we receive at the hands of others, possible for us to lack the grace which reveals itself in tenderness and affection. Tenderness is not simply softness. The tenderness here is often firmness. And every parent understands the necessity of firmness in expressing affection that it is possible to be firm and yet remain one who displays genuine compassion. And that is the tenderness and compassion to which Paul is referring here. Now, those are the four fundamental basis of Paul's incentive to the church in Philippi, of his exhortation that is to follow. You are united with Christ. There is comfort in his love. There is fellowship in the Spirit, and He is the one who manifests tenderness and compassion. These are not up for grabs. These are not questions. These are things that God does amongst His people. So He says, since that is the case, then I want you to make my joy complete. He has already expressed His joy, and what He is saying is, I'd like you to fill my cup of gladness up to overflowing. Have you ever watched the Tour de France, the the bike race, if you're unfamiliar? It's a long and grueling race. The cyclists go through all kinds of physical torture as they race each other across 23 days and over 3.5 kilometers of hills and valleys. And with the amount of energy that they are burning, they need filling up. And if you have ever watched, often what happens is for a brief period, someone will run or ride a motorbike alongside them, holding out drinks and food so that the cyclists can snatch them, fill themselves back up. See, with that much exercise, it is understood that they are running low and need topping up. And Paul's saying here, top me up. That's it. Fill up my joy. Restore my energy. Don't be a drain on my resources. He was already in jail. He was already on the receiving end of all kinds of harsh treatment from those who were against him. What a tragedy it would have been for him to discover that the church were unprepared to do this. Now, the fact is that there were the hints of their selfishness, something that we need to guard ourselves against. There were problems between Euodia and Cynthia. There were some within the fellowship who were beginning to rub one another the wrong way. And so Paul says, because all these things are true, then live in unity. Live in unity. Be like-minded. Have the same love. Be one in spirit and purpose. 
And he heaps these phrases on top of one another. I want you to have the same mind, he says. I want you to have the same love. I want you to have the same spirit. And I want you to have the same purpose. And Paul is saying now, as you think about your relationships with one another as a family, I want you to think together. I want your hearts to beat together. I want you to have one pulse. I want you to have one purpose. And I want you to be driven by one spirit. You go around churches and they glory in the fact that everybody's got their own notion and their own agenda and their own idea. And we're thinking of this and thinking of that. And I'm not talking about people having incentive and initiative. I'm talking about a church that's like the man who got on his horse and galloped off in all directions. And these churches, they, they glory in this. You see, they, they say things like, Oh, well, what a very di- we're very diverse in our plans. And none of us think the same about anything. They become absorbed in their own idea of right. They, they build their own expectations on what the church should be doing, how people should be living, and they'll say, it's a wonderful place, you know. It's very rich. None of us have the same notion of where we're going or what we're doing. You should come along. You can do what you like and go where you want. It's a wonderful place. And it may well have some wonderful dimensions to it. But it holds no attraction for me. And it finds no basis in the pages of the Bible. If a church is to be anything like under the headship, the leadership of the Lord Jesus Christ, then there needs to be this spirit of unity which combines like-mindedness, the same love, one spirit and one purpose. It's interesting that it begins with the mind, isn't it? The Bible has so much to say about our minds because as we think, so we are. And we need to train our minds to think correctly. And then we will begin to love properly. And then we will be able to be in one spirit and purpose. And it starts with the word of God. So that's the first directive, living in unity. Living in unity. And the second directive is living in humility. That's verse 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Surely the greatest obstacle to a life of solidarity, to a life of harmony, is the absence of humility. And the main problem is not hate, but it's self-love. An attitude of conceit and selfishness runs completely counter to that of the Lord Jesus, whose attitude is described in verse 5, which follows and to which we'll come next week. What is he saying in verse 3? He's saying this, church. If you're going to have a church that is attractive, if you're going to have a church that is making progress, then do not, as individuals, cultivate the spirit which is always seeking your own way. Do not become the kind of individuals who are always talking about your own progress, who are always parading your own achievements. Don't get stuck in your own way of doing things. Do not think you're above all this. Rather, stop and listen to others. Understand that different is not necessarily wrong. Realize that even your good deeds often have mixed motives and learn to see the actions of others as coming from the best of motives and yourself as coming from the worst. I heard a preacher say once, when I think about criticizing someone, I have decided always to start with myself. I then find that I don't get much further. 
If you think about that, if we could somehow learn to concentrate on our own bad points and other people's good points, rather than concentrating on other people's bad points and our own good points. Isn't that what we do? Well, look at what she said. I'm glad I didn't say something like that. In fact, I'm really quite good and he's quite bad. If we turn around the other way and start on our own bad, then we'll have plenty of nervous energy left to extol the good points of others. And that is essentially what Paul is getting at here. And the key to it is a spirit of genuine humility. The kind of approach that doesn't take the top seat, the kind of approach that doesn't begin with ourselves all the time. And then finally in verse 4, if verse 2 is a call to live in unity and verse 3 is a call to display humility, then verse 4 is an invitation to generosity, to charity. But charity is the disposition which allows one to think first and most favorably of other people. And that's what he's saying here. That's what Paul is saying. Each of you should look not first to yourself and and to your own concerns, to your own interests and to your own opinions, but you should look to the interests concerns and thoughts of others. When Paul writes to Rome in Romans 15, 2 to 3, he says, let each of us please his neighbor for his good, to build him up, for Christ did not please himself. When I think of myself as the most important person in the equation, when I don't even stop and think of others at all, then it will be very difficult for me to put verse 4 into action. But when I learn to appreciate the opinion of others, to put others first, to see others as better than myself, then I will be far more ready to look to the interests and concerns of others than to look out for my own. Now, at that point, it almost begs the very next sentence, doesn't it? Verse 5. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. So church, for the sake of the gospel, for the encouragement of believers and out of joy for what our Lord has done for us, choose, choose to live in solidarity with one another. Be united. Live in humility and extend charity to all you encounter. Live in unity. Live in humility. Extend charity to those around you. Confrontation with Jesus is the Christian standard. And conformity with Christ is the Christian test. And to that, we will come next week. Let us pray together. Gracious God and loving Father, thank you for the encouragement that there is in your word. Thank you for all of the many blessings and benefits that you grant us. Lord, we long to live in the fullness of these opening verses of Philippians chapter 2. We long that people would know that we are your disciples because we love each other, because we think your thoughts after you. Not that we're clones, but that we're submitted to the word of truth that our hearts would beat together with the love of the Lord Jesus Christ and that we might be prompted and moved by the same Spirit who leads us into all truth and that we might be united in our purpose. Stir up within us then that which will make one another's joy complete, unity, humility and genuine charity. And as we sit before the searching gaze of your word, and we think about the record of our sins and the nature of our lives, we may recognize that we would never be able to enter your presence. Were it not for your grace, we could never stand before you. And so we thank you, Lord, for your grace and for all your goodness to us as we pray in Jesus' name. And all the Lord's people said,
Amén.